Today we are going to be carrying on in the series that began several weeks ago called Upside Down Blessings, which is a study in the Beatitudes. I know some of you are thinking, is he going to preach on this forever? <laughs> well, maybe. You know, you never know. It's, it's getting us somewhere. And uh, I'm excited about the Beatitudes, love the Beatitudes. They're the introduction or the preamble to the Sermon on the Mount. And I've been telling you this throughout this series, that the Sermon on the Mount is about conduct. It's about what we are to do and how we are to live as Christians. But the Beatitudes is about character, and it's who we are to be. And what you do comes out of who you are. And I'm going to make a provocative statement here this morning. I believe that the eight Beatitudes are more important than the Ten Commandments. And I know that that might be startling for a few of you, but I want you to think about this. The, the Ten Commandments don't seem to have the power to change the world, but the Beatitudes do. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, the scripture actually says, Romans 8, that what the law was not able to do because of the weakness of the flesh, God did by sending his son into the world. Or in other words, the reason the Ten Commandments don't work and they're righteous, don't misunderstand me, but they try to work from the outside in, Whereas what happens when, with, through what Jesus did is he works from the inside out. And that's what the Beatitudes is all about. How many of you are familiar with the uh, novelist uh, Kurt Vonnegut Jr.? How many of you would recognize that name? Really? Like six of you? Come on. You people read. I know you know him. I know you know him. Never mind. And uh, anyway, here's what Kurt Vonnegut calls himself. He referred to himself as a Christ-loving atheist. And even though he wasn't actually a Christian, he loved the New Testament and particularly the words of Jesus. And his most favorite thing in the world was the Beatitudes. And I saw him on an interview once, and this is what he said. He said, there are many Christians today that are demanding that the Ten Commandments be posted in public buildings. And this is what he asked. He said, how come no one ever demands that the Beatitudes be posted in public buildings? How about blessed be the merciful in the courtroom and blessed be the peacemakers in the Pentagon? And see, he understood something about what the Beatitudes have the ability to do. So this morning we're talking about blessed be the peacemaker. And my message is entitled Peaceful Warriors. And I'm going to be showing you, hopefully, how to fight for peace. You see the irony in that, don't you? And, uh, you know, here's this story. There was this uh, journalist, and she had gone down to the holy city of Jerusalem, and she was in the old city. And she was doing a story on the city, and every morning she would look out her hotel window, and, and against the western wall, sometimes inappropriately called the Wailing Wall, there was a, an Orthodox Jew, and he was, he was praying against the wall every morning. And so every day she noticed he was there, and one day after he had finished praying, she went down and she asked him and said, uh, sir, excuse me, how often do you come down to pray at the wall? And he said, three times a day. And she says, how long have you been doing this? He says, for 25 years I've been doing this. And she says, what do you pray for? And he says, I pray for peace in the Middle East. And she said, what does that feel like to pray for 25 years for the peace in the Middle East? He says, honestly, some days it feels like I'm talking to a wall. <laughs> You see, being a peacemaker is a big challenge in our day and age. And this is what the Beatitude says. It says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Now understand what that means. We are all sons of God, but the peacemakers are the ones that are going to be identified. They're the ones that are going to be recognized as the sons of God. And see, it's one thing for you to be a son of God. It's another thing for you to be recognized and to people who actually call you a son of God. See, let me ask you this. I, I, I've said it many times before. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would they have enough evidence to convict you? And you see, people should actually recognize us as, as, as Christians. I want to tell you a story about Mike. Mike is down at the Bronx Park campus. And Mike, from the very beginning, has been on the setup crew. He's a single father, and he's really a great guy. And they come uh, actually two hours before the service, and they set things up. It takes about an hour, and they have to set up the stage and the chairs and the lights and the projectors, and it's a big job. And, and he and this other group of guys come, and they do that for an hour. And then at the end of the service, they spend another hour tearing the whole thing down and, and packing it into a truck. And uh, Mike was telling me, I was there a couple of weeks ago preaching, and uh, Mike was telling me this story. He runs a small construction crew for a bigger company. And uh, they were working at a grocery store chain. And, the, and then the chain, after they did this little project, had decided to award them a bigger contract. And this is what the grocery store said to his boss. They said, we're going to give you the contract for this bigger construction job, but we want the Christian guy. 
They wanted Mike. And I want you to think about this. First of all, not only did they identify him as a Christian, but they actually called him as a Christian. And then the most surprising thing was they actually wanted him as a Christian. And see, I love that story because that's what this is all about. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. We'll be identified as the sons of God. Now, I think one of the big challenges for us in the Beatitudes is this one. I think we might be doing a poorer job with being peacemakers than any of the other Beatitudes. And I think one of the reasons is, is because I don't think we know what it means to be a peacemaker. When I ask you that question, what is a peacemaker, I'm wondering what your answer would be. Let me throw a couple of things out. In, in 1873, this was a peacemaker. It was made by Colt, it was a handgun, and they used it for killing people, the Colt Peacekeeper. In 1965, this was a peacekeeper. Uh, they were hippies that ran around smoking dope, burning their bras, not sure what they did that for, and, and listening to John Lennon protesting peace, peace man. And in the height of the arms race, in 1986, this was a peacemaker, literally. It was an intercontinental ballistic missile that is called, actually, the peacekeeper, not the peacemaker. It is a 300 megaton or 300 kiloton nuclear warhead capable of 20 times the devastation of the atomic bomb that destroyed the city of Hiroshima in 1945. And I mean, I don't even understand this as how you could call that a peacekeeper. They call it, I love, I, I love this twisted logic. They call it a nuclear deterrent. And there are some 10,000 of those warheads, intercontinental ballistic missiles, pointed at various cities around the world right now, and you hardly ever hear anybody talking about it anymore. Have you noticed that? They're still aimed at each other. And I'm pretty sure, I don't want to scare you, but I've read the book of Revelation, and it seems like one day they're going to go off and blow everything to smithereens. Just my guess, you know. Don't listen to me. What do I know, right? I want to give you a little story here. How many of you remember... 1969, it was the summer, and uh, Apollo 12 landed on the moon, so you've got to be old enough to remember the 1969. How many of you remember when Apollo 6, 12 landed on the moon? How many of you remember that? And Neil Armstrong and the, and the boys, they got out of that, that craft, and they walked on the moon for the very first time, and they erected a plaque, this part you might not remember, and they re erected a plaque on the moon, it's still there today, and I'm going to show it to you, here it is. And uh, this is what it says. It's got their, their signatures on it. And it says, we came in peace for all mankind. And that was set on the moon in 1969. And wouldn't you know it, there's been peace on the moon ever since. <laughs> so it's totally working, folks. So isn't that fa fantastic? Almost 50 years and they still have peace on the moon. Now take a wild stab at it. Why do you think there is peace on the moon? Because there are no people on the moon. That is why. Meanwhile, back on planet Earth, in 5,600 years of recorded history, we have only had 286 years of world peace. And most of those were thousands of years ago when there was hardly any people. Right now in the world, there are 100 military conflicts being fought somewhere in the world. Now, we always think of Syria and we think of Iraq, but in fact, there are places all over the world where people are killing each other, literally rising up and killing their neighbors many times and most of the times in civil wars. That's the world in which we live in. So 1,000 years ago, sorry, rather 2,000 years ago, Jesus shows up whose name was the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Peace shows up 2,000 years ago, and as far as I can tell, he didn't do anything to mitigate world peace or to bring world peace, right? In fact, he commented on it. Have you remembered his comment? And he said this. He said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but do not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, and then the end will come. I don't know. Jesus told me not to worry about it. I'm still worried about it. And that doesn't really help me. And see, here's the big question. Why did Jesus come and not deal with it? Why didn't he come, if he was the Prince of Peace, why didn't he bring world peace? Now, what you have to do is you have to zoom out and you have to see the bigger picture. Because there's going to come a time in the age to come where he will bring world peace. Sometimes we call it the millennium. Sometimes we call it the age to come. And see, if we look back, I want you to think about this. If you look back into the past, you will see the Old Testament which is admittedly very violent. How many would agree with that? 
I think distressingly so when you read the Old Testament. And then if we look the other direction, if we look into the future, into the millennial, a reign which is a thousand years of peace, this is what the scripture says about it. I'm going to throw it up on the screen. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, it says, They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So what the scripture tells us is that there is a day coming ahead of us that will be peace on earth. And there will not even be weapons. They will beat their swords into plowshares, or so though our weapons are going to become instruments of agriculture. And it says, nation will not rise up against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So the future looks very bright. The past looks very dark. And what about the age at which we live in now? And see, what we need to understand theologically is that we live in a transition age. The age we live in is sometimes called in Scripture this present evil age. And it's actually an overlap of the, what happened in the Old Testament with the violence of the Old Testament and the peace of the, of, of the future and the age to come. We live in the overlap, the transition between these two periods of time. And it's a bigger theological truth, but when Jesus came, he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He didn't say it was here now and in, in imminent this moment, but he said it's at hand, it's pending. And what he taught us is he said, when you pray, when you pray say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so what we do, in essence, is we invoke the powers of the age to come, and we invoke the peace of the age to come on our present evil age. We are living in a dynamic tension between the violence of the Old Testament in the past and the peace of the age to come. And we are stuck in this, and we are commanded to be the peacemakers in the midst of that. Now, it's difficult for us because we have to reconcile the fact that we live in the tension between these two eras. So we're going to go today, and we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to see how we deal with this conflict and this tension that we live in. So Ephesians chapter 12, or 2 rather, uh, verse 14 says this, For he himself is our peace, who made both one and has broken down the middle wall of division between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So what he is talking about here is he's talking about these two that he's talking about are the Jews and the Gentiles. And he's talking about how there was enmity and there was animosity between these two groups. There was violence between these groups all the way through the Old Testament. And he says, what happened at the cross? That Jesus became our peace. And because, here's how simple it is. Because he has reconciled man to God, then by virtue of that relationship, he reconciles man to man. And he says he broke down the middle wall of division and enmity between humankind because we find peace with God. Now let me explain to you how this works. Last week I told you that all of the Beatitudes are actually predicated on the Beatitude that comes before them. That it is a progression and you can't do one without the one that immediately preceded. Last week we talked about blessed are those who are pure in heart for they shall see God. And I said that people can't change from the outside in. The laws don't work on people because people don't know how to keep them. But if you will change one's heart, if they will become pure in heart, then they change from the inside out. So don't miss the progression. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who are being changed from the inside out. For they shall see God. And then the very next beatitude is blessed be the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So our ability to make peace in the world is based on the condition of our heart. And here's the simple truth that I want you to understand. If we will discover inner peace with God, we can have peace with one another. Jesus talked about this very issue in the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount, by the way, restated many of the Ten Commandments. And in fact, he quotes one of them. And he says this, you have heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, if you have anger towards your brother, you are guilty of judgment. What was he saying? He was saying, sure, murder's wrong. But he says, that's not the real issue. The real issue is what's in your heart, the anger in your heart. Here's what I want to tell you today. 
that violence in our world is not the problem. What is? Hatred in our heart. It's the hatred we have to one another. And see, this is what Jesus goes after. He doesn't go after our externals. I mean, yes, violence is wrong. Yes, violence is bad. And there's no way you can legislate against it. The only way you can deal with the problem and the conflict within humankind is to deal first with the issues of one's heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. And they become the peacemakers. And when they have found peace with God and inner peace, they can find peace with one another. That is the key to being a peacemaker. I want to tell you the story of Arno Michaelis today. And this young man grew up in a home that was a violent, alcoholic home. And he was an angry man. And he grew up looking for a cause. And he wanted to be a warrior and fight against something. And of all the causes, he, he chose white supremacy to be his cause. And he thought he would fight for the preservation of the white race, of all things. But anyway, so he becomes a neo-Nazi. He becomes a white supremacist. He forms a punk group with racist lyrics that actually invoke the killing and violence against other races. And this, this guy has lots of issues and lots of problems. And I'm going to show you a picture of him when he was a white, white supremacist. There he is. It just his face looks angry. I love his tattoo. I mean, he spelled Dollarama wrong, for one thing. Uh, I think he ran out of ink, right? And that word uh, is dolor, actually, by the way. And that word means uh, intense distress or sorrow. And I think that tattoo over his heart actually describes the condition of the darkness of his heart. So anyway, this guy goes through life. He's covered in these, these tattoos of hate. He's, he's speaking against and raging against everything and everyone. And he's full of anger and full of hatred and full of violence. And he notices that his friends and the people who are part of this are ending up in jail or dead. Because that's the world in which he lives in. And so one day he's in the McDonald's and he's ordering a Big Mac. And he's got a tattoo on his middle finger of a swastika. And he goes to pay the gal, and the gal that was working the till was a black woman. And she sees the tattoo of the swastika. And in a kind way, she said this. She said, you know what? I don't think that's who you are. You're better than that. She points at the tattoo. Bold lady, right? And he was so ashamed in that moment that he took his Big Mac and he left and he never went back to that McDonald's again. And he said what happened was everywhere he went, it was like there was a conspiracy of kindness against him. And he said there was people of grace and people of forgiveness and people of compassion everywhere he went. And he said from my Jewish boss to my lesbian supervisor to the black and the Latino co-workers, people took me on and loved me and accept me the way I was, even though my heart was filled with hate. And I re-examined my life and realized that that was not how I wanted to live. And so I saw him on television the other day. This is why I'm bringing him up. And he had this big smile on his face. And he was talking about how the only way we're ever going to have peace in this world is if we first have inner peace with ourselves. Exactly what the scripture says. Exactly what I'm saying. Exactly what Jesus said. I want to show you the picture of this man who, who goes out and campaigns for inner peace today. He doesn't look like the same man. You can tell from his, his inter, external persona that something had changed on the inside. And see, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. But honestly, in 2,000 years of Christian history, we're actually not doing a really good job with this. You know that some of Christendom of the last 2,000 years has looked as bad as the Old Testament. I mean, you think of the Middle Ages, you think of the Crusades in the Middle Ages from uh, the, the 12th and the 13th century. There was 200 years where European Christians attacked the Middle East in what they called the Crusades under the guise of liberating uh, the holy city of Jerusalem. And they went through for 200 years raping and pillaging and killing people like a bunch of Vikings or pirates, all in the name of Christ. And they mowed down everybody in their path, not just Muslims, but Jews and Christians and anybody that was in their way. And they did it all in Christ's name. Talk about a dark spot in the Christian history. But I look at the world today, and I have to ask myself, are we much better even today? We have so much hatred and so much violence in our hearts. Look at the biggest Christian nation in the world, which would be the United States, just south of our border. Here's the biggest Christian nation, which is also one of the most violent nations in the world. Do you know that there are 91 people who lose their life every day in gun violence in the U.S.? 91. Seven of them are children. 
that are lost every single day. It's over 13,000 people every single year are mowed down with weapons. And here's what I want, and I'm not trying to make a big political statement, but I do want to connect some dots here. Here's a nation of 300 million people that owns 300 million guns. And my question is, is it really necessary? Is that many guns necessary? Is it necessary for everybody to be carrying a gun? And they'll argue that I'm carrying it for self-defense. That is such a false sense of security. Do you know that some, some goofball like you or me carrying a gun, if we came across a, a career cam, criminal, we would be dead before we had the presence of mind to ever think about pulling a gun and shooting another human being with it. So this idea of carrying around these guns, I mean, contrast what's going on in the US with the UK. Great Britain, where the police don't even carry guns, they only have 30 gun deaths in an entire year. It's a big difference, isn't it? Now, in a country like that, you know, if you want to kill somebody, you have to bludgeon them to death with a blunt object. It's super inconvenient. It takes time, it's messy, it takes a bunch of effort. Now, now they'll do it, they'll still do it, and you know what, mostly at soccer games, but it's so, <laughs> it's so inconvenient. Meanwhile, my, my, my friends, I have pastor friends in the U.S., and, and they will tell me this. They say that on any given Sunday while they're preaching in their congregation, there will be at least a dozen men packing heat. And they tell me that it gives them a sense of security and comfort. I said, are you kidding? While I'm preaching, the last thing I want is people in the audience carrying guns. Are you kidding me? It's just a matter of time before I say something stupid or inappropriate or offensive. Could you imagine? So one ill-timed Mennonite joke and guns come out and bullets are flying everywhere. You know what the Mennonites are like, don't you? You, you get the irony in this, right? You know, they, you know they're, they're pacifists. But, but don't let them fool you, people. They, they are a paradox of Mennonite people. You know the three greatest religious truths? Number one, that the Jews do not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Number two, the Protestants do not recognize the Pope as the head of the church. And number three, Mennonites do not recognize each other in the liquor store. <laughs> it's a paradox, people. That's why, that's why when you go on a fishing trip, you, you always take two Mennonites with you. It, the reason is, if you take one Mennonite, he's going to drink all your beer. If you take two Mennonites, they don't drink any. So, so go figure. Do you really want people at church carrying handguns, or any other gun for that matter? I know I don't. Let me tell you what happened last week. You're going to love this story. So last Saturday night, I'm up here preaching and doing what I do, and I looked down right about the soundboard over there, and I had, didn't see him come in. I didn't know why he was there. There's an armed guard standing there. There's a man, he's got a badge, and he's got some sort of uniform. He's clearly law enforcement, and he's got a gun. And he's standing there like this, his arms crossed, and he's staring at me. Now, I'm so, I'm so self-centered, I think he's there for me, right? And, and so I'm thinking... There's some guy, some cop, some law enforcement has shown up. I'm getting arrested when I'm done preaching. But fortunately, he's been polite enough to wait for me to finish. And he's got his arms crossed and his gun sitting there. And I thought, he's taking me away. The minute I'm done preaching, I'm getting arrested. So I'm starting to get nervous up here, right? And so I thought, well, I'm not stopping preaching. This is going to be <laughs> one seriously long message in order to def defer this inevitability. So anyway, eventually I ran out of material. I had to close down the, the sermon, and, and I'm looking up as I'm praying at the end, and he's still there, and he's still got his arms crossed, and he's still back in that heat. And so, so I'm standing there wondering what was going on, and then I realized what had happened, because I see our, our, our chaplain, we have a chaplain named Dean from Stony Mountain Penitentiary, and he's here with an inmate. And the inmate is out for the first time in over 20 years. He was convicted of a, of a violent crime. He was given his first escorted visit outside of the penitentiary. They sent a correctional officer with a gun with him to escort him here. He could go anywhere he wanted, and he chose to come to a service at Church of the Rock. It's the second time that's happened. It happened a couple of years ago, too. Same sort of scenario. So I was, sort of had this sense of relief. Oh, that gun's for someone else. That's... A, <laughs> pretty happy about that. And so, so I went down and I introduced myself to the inmate and he was, he was actually quite a character, this inmate, and he started telling me jokes. He was really my kind of guy. And he starts telling me jokes and this is what he said, honest to goodness, in front of the correctional officer with the gun, this is what he said. 
He said, Pastor Mark, how many correctional officers does it take to throw an inmate down the stairs? I said, I don't know, how many? He says, none. He slipped and fell. <laughs> and I cracked up, realizing how inappropriate my, <laughs> my laughing was. And I looked at the correctional officer, and he cracked a smile. I said, I said, that was inappropriate, but that was funny, wasn't it? So anyway, I decide I'm going to tell this story. So last night, I'm telling the story. Guess who shows up again? Last night, the inmate showed up without the correctional officer. They've decided they trust them enough to send him without, out without an armed man. And so he was here with Dean, our chaplain. I'm telling this story when I referred to the inmate from Stony Mountain. He stood up and waved at everybody. <laughs> I did not see that coming. And he stands up and he waves at everybody. Everybody gave him a big cheer. And so he's waving. He was as pleased as punch. I told him later, I said, you know what? I was deliberately going to be anonymous and not embarrass you, but I will never stop someone from embarrassing themselves if they want. And so, so here's, here's where I'm trying to go with this. I'm just trying to get us to understand uh, that violence begets violence. And Jesus said, who, he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. And for the life of me, I don't understand why any society would need people carrying handguns and assault weapons and machine guns, all of which are legal in the United States. And those, design, those guns are designed for one purpose and one purpose only, for killing people. Why would civilians have weapons that were designed to kill people? Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I've got to tell you this, that I am a gun owner. And I have owned guns since I was... 12 years old, but I don't carry them around in public, and I don't kill people with them. Aren't you glad? Now, I would like to kill every Canada goose that spends its summer in Winnipeg, but they frown on that. Have you noticed? There's all these rules that we have about discharging a firearm in the city and hunting out of season, and so, so I'm just leaving them be. And well, except I am, I'm trying to reduce the population with the bumper of my car. That's a, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Do you, honest, do you honestly think I'm serious about this? Come on, people. I'm, not, I'm, I'm kidding. It was the police ruled it a suicide. <laughs> I got off. I'm still kidding. I'm still, how many of you are tracking with me about how we might just have too many geese? How many of you like the geese? Good. I'll send them to your house because I don't like them. Here, here's where I'm going. All kidding aside, here's where I'm going. I don't think there's one single thing in the New Testament that can ju justify violent behavior on the heart of a Christian. I don't think we have the right to be violent. Jesus said what? Turn the other cheek. Jesus told us to love our neighbor, to do good to those who hate us. He told us to, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your might and all your soul and to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and just a thought, if you love your neighbor, you probably won't kill them, right? And you see, there's something about this. Jesus went to the, to the cross like a lamb to the slaughter. And I don't believe that the New Testament even tells us to defend ourselves. Now, I understand law enforcement. I understand going to war and fighting for the defense of your country. I get that. But when I look at it, I think there's too many of us that have this, this violence in our heart. Let me explain something to you from uh, Scripture and, and where this all plays in. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus tells a story. And this story is about some Galileans that had gone down to the temple in Jerusalem. And they, while they were making their sacrifices and, and killing and the, the sacrifices were bleeding, what happened was Pontius Pilate ordered a raid and these Galileans were actually killed and their blood was mingled with, with the, the sacrifices. This caused great outrage. It was a huge social injustice. And in Luke chapter 13, some of the Galileans came to Jesus and they asked him about this. And they wanted him to comment on this, on this question. And it's fascinating what Jesus said. Because understand this. I'm going to back up just for a moment. So you can put yourself in the place of these Galileans asking this question. What they were talking about and the visceral response they had in their heart would not be how we react when we hear about ISIS beheading people overseas. And when you see those images or hear about those images, be honest. Does it not produce something within you? Does it not produce in you a cry for justice or vengeance or revenge or hatred? And that's what it produces in, in our heart. And see, here's the problem. When we fall prey of that and when we become anxious about that, we become part of the problem, not part of the answer. 
And see, so Jesus gets, a, they address him on this. And they say, what about the Galileans whose blood was mingled with the sacrifice? And this is what Jesus said. He said, do you think those Galileans were any worse sinners who suffered that fate than you? Therefore, I say to you, if you do not repent, you likewise will perish. What did Jesus say? He took a huge social outrage of injustice and he turned it around for a demand of personal repentance. Do you see, that's always the issue. The issue is always our heart. And when we see things, when we see the atrocities that are going on in the world, when we see and hear of child abuse or human slavery, or we hear of the mob killing and hitting people, and we hear about the violence in different parts of the world, and we see those images, it can do one or two things. It can produce anger and violence and vengeance in our heart, which Jesus condemns, or it can turn us towards personal repentance. And that's what the peacemaker is. The peacemaker is the person who has discovered that that is the essence of what being a peacemaker is, is to have peace in your heart so you can have peace with one another. I want to tell you a story that happened a number of years ago, not too many. There was a man by the name of Lynn Green. He was with YWAM, and he felt like the Lord spoke to him about doing something. And uh, 900 years ago, the first crusade started. It was 1096 to 1099. By 1099, they had in, invaded uh, the Holy Land. They had they'd come into Jerusalem. And so he felt like the Lord spoke to him about retracing the steps, the three-year journey, 1,500 miles from Europe to Jerusalem. And as he went to repent to those people that were the descendants of the people that were, were slain and, and harmed during the Crusades, 2,500 people uh, at different times joined him on that th three-year journey. And he walked literally from Europe to Jerusalem through those countries like Turkey and Syria and through the Middle East. And every chance that he had, they went to mosques and to synagogues and even to churches. And they repented for the deeds that happened 900 years earlier in the Crusades. And when you read about his story, it's fascinating. Because what happened was he said in every single city that they went to, in every single place, no one rejected their repentance. Every single one of them accepted them and honored them. Why? Because blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Let me close with one final story here today. And uh, in Africa, in this country of Nigeria, they have a huge problem. And it's a conflict between the Muslims and the Christians. And in the north of Nigeria, you have most of the Muslims. In the south of Nigeria, you have most of the Christians. And along the 10th parallel, it's basically the line between these. And anybody that lives on the line, the demarcation between the Muslims and the Christians, it's a very violent and very conflicting place. And there was a pastor there in, in the city of Kaduna, Nigeria, and his name is Pastor James. And Pastor James has had a hatred in his heart for a long time towards his Muslim neighbors. And they have had actual armed combats in their city. And he himself lost his right arm in one of these combats. And he got it completely severed off. His arm was gone. He was at a conference one day and the preacher was speaking on the beatitude, blessed be the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. And he felt in his heart that God was speaking to him the fact that he's never going to reach Muslims for Christ if he hates them. And if he has this bitterness towards them. And he needed to repent, needed to begin to love them and begin to care for them, for Jesus said to love your neighbor. So this is what he did in response to that. He went to the local Oman at the mosque, and he repented to the Oman. And he said, I'm sorry for my part of the violence, sorry for my part of the hatred in this city, and I want to make it right. And the two of them became great friends, the Muslim Iman and the Christian pastor, and they made a pact that they were going to travel together and they were going to bring a message of reconciliation to their community. So the two of them went and they would spoke, speak together and they had great results. And here's a picture of the two of them. I just want you to see these two men, uh, the, the, the pastor on one side, the imam on the other. And if you look at, carefully at the pastor's right arm, which he's not shaking hands with, that's a prosthetic arm that he has because he lost his arm. And so these are the people that took his arm but he realized he had to replace the vengeance and hatred in his heart with the love and compassion for his neighbor and his friend. So these two men begin to travel together. They traveled together for 15 years. They stayed in the same hotel rooms. 
He said, in the early days, there would be times when I'd wake up in the middle of the night and this thought would come to me about taking my pillow and suffocating the Amman. But he said, I resisted. And what happened was a great love and a great respect came between these two men. And the city of Kaduna, Nigeria, has peace today because two men found it in their heart to find that inner peace that would spread and be shed abroad to one another. You see, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. We have a world that is full of violence, full of hatred, full of animosity, full of racism, full of all of these things. We are the answer to this problem. When we begin to get reconciled and understand our reconciliation with God, when we begin to discover that inner peace that does something within us, when we begin to look at our neighbor with a pureness of heart, then we become that peacemaker. And blessed be that peacemaker, you, because you shall be called a son of God. Let's stand together, shall we?